So far, and in the previous video, when we discussed statements, these were all delivered in what we call natural language. That is just simply how people speak and how people write. What I'm saying now, I'm verbalising these ideas in the English language. That is obviously the language which I, which I speak. The problem with natural languages compared to a more formal mathematical or logical setting is there's a bit of imprecision in there which doesn't make a big difference on a day-to-day -day basis but can be a bit of a problem when it comes to understanding these things with what we need as mathematical precision and a mathematically precise definition. And a good example of that is the word or. In everyday life, there's actually two different interpretations of or. What we think of as inclusive or, or exclusive or. Now, in everyday situations, it is almost always obvious to somebody who has been in society and multiple conversations what somebody means. We don't deliberately misinterpret things or confuse each other but the context is very important but if we're going to use statements logically formally mathematically we want to clean up some of this ambiguity because we don't have that same sense of societal norms and context an example would be if somebody offered to make you a cup of coffee and they said to you while making it, would you like milk or sugar? You're not going to think, well, I want some milk, but I also want sugar, but I can only have milk or sugar. So would I prefer milk? If I have milk, I don't have sugar. Or if I have sugar, I don't have milk. Normally, people would understand that the offer, do you want milk or sugar, actually means inclusively. Would you like milk? Or would you like sugar? Or would you like both of them? The idea that one does not exclude the other. That is, for most people, I think, how they would interpret the statement. Would you like milk or sugar? they would interpret that as milk or sugar, or possibly both. Whereas a different question, say your maternal grandfather, your mum's father, if somebody asked, oh, is your maternal grandfather dead or alive? The person isn't really meaning, is your grandfather dead? or is your grandfather alive, or maybe both. Nobody is meaning that, and it's very clear that the context is one of those questions clearly is a that or that, but not both, and the other potentially allows for the inclusive, including the overlap, which is the and as well. Now, if we're going to use these in more formal definitions, we want to have an agreement on how some of these logical connectives will be evaluated. And we often will use truth tables when working with logic to evaluate statements. And by evaluating a statement, I mean assign a true or false. To it. This statement, is it true, is it not true? So there's a few different conventions and if you look on different sources or different textbooks you might see different things. Generally they will be recorded as zeros or ones or T or F, true or false or one for true, 
and zero for false. Any of those conventions um, is fine. I will tend to use the zero one, but you may see other sources elsewhere. So the connective and is much less ambiguous, but logically we'll denote it with this up deck, this upwards arrow head. And if I've got two statements, the statement A and the statement B, A and B is only true when A is true and B is true. The opposite of that, I suppose, is or, which we donate with this downwards arrowhead, and that is only true when at least one of them, so one or the other, or possibly both of the statements, um, uh, is true. So what we have there is what we're saying is that this or and the downwards arrowhead is an inclusive definition of or. So let's agree that when we say or, mathematically, logically, we do include the idea that it could be multiple of those. We include the overlap. And the other main one, which is the negation, not. So a statement is, um, not true only when it's false and it's not false only when it's true so if i've got an original statement and i negate that the negation just reverses the true or false nature of the original statement being negated now that sounds very obvious and very easy but it also when we see some more complex statement, it's very easy to get that wrong. And we'll see some examples of statements that you might think are easy to negate, but actually aren't quite so obvious or intuitive for all people. In this video, I will denote true statements with a one and false statements with a zero and i'm just going to work through well, the two main connectives and the negation so if i work these out i set up truth tables which is a simple way of writing that if the statements about p and q are true or false as stated on each line what is the connective P and Q, the connection with the connective P or Q, and the negation, well, there's only one statement there, not P. So for the AND table, the way that I would read that is P, the top line, P1, Q1, P is true, Q is true, so P and Q is true. Every other line example the second line p1 q0 p is true q is false well if q is false p and q isn't true so in the and table it's only true if every statement is true so the only line which is true is the line entirely of ones which is the top line for the second truth table or p or q well p or q only requires p to be true or q to be true or both of them so at least one of the original statements p or q has to be a one so in fact if either p or q or both has a one then p or q should have a one and be true so the top line the second line the third line all have a one in them so they should all make p or q true the bottom line which denotes p is false q is false 
and P or Q must be false. And the easiest one here is the negation, whereby if P is true, not P is false. And if P is false, not P is true. So I simply reverse the one and the zero. 